As society increasingly consumes news in online spaces, a shift in journalist audience relations and the style of news consumption has occurred. This media production will tackle the case of digital news sources, where the notion of filter bubbles, the audience effect on media outlets, and the inclusion of comment sections within news stories may be impacting the very news we're exposed to, our consumption habits, and our perceptions of the news itself. Increasingly, the window through which the public views the world is no longer the front page of the New York Times, but the Facebook newsfeed. Users no longer need to select a news source. Instead, they select the story itself. There is evidence that our selection of news is impacted based on the number of likes, shares, and retweets the article may have. Additionally, how we perceive the news may be impacted by accompanying commentary, produced not by the journalist, but by the audience of the story. Lastly, the news we see on social media networks is subject to information filters, powered by algorithms, meaning there's a lot more out there that we're not seeing in our feeds at all. While the news may be becoming increasingly democratic in terms of audience inclusion in journalism, one of the major questions that comes out of a discussion of the filter bubble case is this. Is online personalization and filtering a democratic process? In Canada and the US, it is. With basic Western rights such as free speech and freedom of the press, it is undoubtedly democratic to personalize your online experience and to align with the political affiliations of your choice. But if we rephrase the question a little bit to this, is online personalization and filtering lending to an informed democratic society? Then the case might point to an answer of no. The simple exposure to alternative viewpoints does not necessarily lead to an increased engagement and consumption by users from the other side. Additionally, with the media writing to meet audience desires, we may not be exposed to narratives from non-dominant minorities at all. This further strengthens an argument to provide opportunities within educational settings for appropriate media and technology education within schools. Most current users of social media are unaware of the possible implications of filter bubbles or the impact of media metrics and audience commentary on online news story releases. Everyone should have increasingly transparent access to this knowledge, whether through frequent and visible disclaimers in social media and digital news sources, or through educational opportunities in K-12 or college-level spaces, or both. Critical engagement with this topic could expand users' understandings of the importance of democratic informants in polarized political races, of global current events like the Syrian refugee crisis, and policy developments around issues like gun violence or abortion. In the next section, we'll be exploring how concepts like filter bubbles, audience metrics, and the inclusion of commentary can impact our daily media consumption online. How do filter bubbles impact the news that we consume on a daily basis? Filter bubble is a term introduced in 2011 by Eli Pariser in his book and popular TED Talk on the topic. So I do think this is a problem. And uh, I think if you take all of these filters together, if you take all of these algorithms, you get what I call a filter bubble. And your filter bubble is kind of your own personal, unique universe of information that you live in online. And what's in your filter bubble depends on who you are, and it depends on what you do. But the thing is that you don't decide what gets in. And more importantly, you don't actually see what gets edited out. According to Pariser, the concept of online selective exposure is created by algorithms on social media sites and search engines alike in an attempt to continually create a personalized web experience for the user. This personalization caters to the user's likes, preferences, and political leanings, offering them stories, links, and page suggestions that may align with their views in an attempt to keep them engaged online for longer periods of time. Pariser argues that these personalized algorithms are a cause for concern, reducing the traditional gatekeeping tasks of editors and producers to a simple mathematical automation, taking the humanistic judgment out of the equation to deliver balanced democratic content. Since 2011, Pariser's claim has been both widely supported and contested by researchers and the public alike. Facebook's Eaton Bakshi has conducted studies on whether or not the filter bubble exists, Bakshi states that friend circles are a result of individual choice, though Pariser counters that it's really hard to separate individual choice and the workings of an algorithm for personalization. A 2014 study by Messing and Westwood supports Bakshi's findings, highlighting that an individual's personal choice to maintain a politically homogenous network of online contacts was unlikely. 
Messing later worked with Bakshi and Adamek of Facebook in another study to debunk the notion that users may have diverse information filtered out of their news feeds. Their study's generalization to the entire Facebook population is limited, as it only observes the 9% of Facebook users who report their political affiliation on their profile. Other studies, such as Boz Dagadal, generally support filter bubbles, but say their existence depends on the metric and political segregation of the observed country. The frequent rhetoric we see in the West doesn't necessarily hold in a country like Syria. Bosdag et al. elaborate that the Facebook research does not indicate whether we encounter and engage with news that imposes our own beliefs, and that population preferences for media tend towards the middle and the mainstreams. The preferences of the minorities will not reach a larger public. Other scholars agree with this sentiment, such as Volkic or Brighton Nichols, who state that particular social classes or groupings who read news online less frequently might find their issues being subtly shifted down the agenda. As we consider the idea of the filter bubble, we also must consider other implications of Messing and Westwood's study, which shows that people are more inclined to open news that has been shared more often than news that is not. Other research shows that even online editors are becoming swayed by the availability of audience metrics and sharing patterns in social media spaces, and may even have their hands tied by corporate backers and media outlets to these numbers. With data shifting editorial bias on deciding what news is, news producers are catering more and more to audience desires than ever before. Our last investigation will transcend beyond mathematical algorithms filtering content and shares having a direct impact on future news stories. How do we, the audience, actually impact one another in our perception of online news? In 2012, researcher Eun-Ju Lee found that user-generated comments might exert a direct impact on an individual's perception about a news story, and may mistakenly attribute the opinions expressed in users' comments to the news article itself. Moreover, Ian Rowe finds that commentary associated with news articles at their actual link source are far richer than the commentary left on social media sites such as Facebook. This is highly problematic because, as we established previously, this is where over 50% of people are now getting their news. Cognizant awareness of our news consumption, both online and offline, are prudent in developing a balanced understanding of world events. Journalists like Dr. Foker Hanisch suggest that we need to take such affirmative action on our own media consumption. His article following the Paris terrorist attacks of November 2015 tackles the issue of disproportionate coverage in contemporary Western media, demonstrating through audience metrics that we only seem to care about and consume stories about people like us, tying the hands of journalists to stories their audiences might care about over ones that they won't. Digital media education within schools could further impact this understanding within the citizens of tomorrow, who could be given opportunities to respond to polarized issues and news topics within safe spaces. This may offer some level of tolerance and emergence of progressive discourse over an increased time of exposure. Dr. Hanisch closes his article with a poignant statement that fits well beside the democratic cry within this case. There are opportunities for change but the responsibility lies with both audiences and the media for that to happen. This media production focused on the case of digital news sources and the impact of filter bubbles, use of audience metrics on news availability and engagement, and the impact of audience commentary on news perceptions. The effects of these concepts are often quite invisible to media consumers in nature and may surprise the average user upon learning about them. A combination of educational opportunities, media transparency, and individual action may help users to critically explore the value of exposure to opposing democratic ideals, as to help to build empathy, shape their own viewpoint, and to promote the development of civil discourse on political topics.